Here we go. Hi, today I have amazing two speakers and we're going to be talking about some very powerful things, especially at times of COVID or any type of crisis. Anytime you're going in trouble, your families are going through that too. So today I welcome Vinu Keller from United States. Welcome on board, Vinu. It's uh, so good to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, she's the founder of Vinu Inspires that Gone. She also has a book about how to empower families. She started with kids that are being bullied and her passion was so into empowering them, it turned up to uh, empowering families. So today she's gonna be talking a little bit about that and also the further studies and the things that she has done. Also, before we start, I would like to welcome Orkun. Orkun, welcome on board. Hey, it's nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you very much for being here. Orkun is a, uh, is a counseling psychologist, right? Did I say yeah, it right? Yeah. And he's going to be coming from the perspective of the clinical side on some issues that we will be issuing, we'll be looking at. So, Vinu, welcome on board. Please tell us a little bit about you, what you do, and why you're here today. So um, I have been on a journey of personal growth for over 15 years now, I believe. Um, I started off my life, um, I would say my journey that brought me here, I was suicidal for 21 years. I used to self-harm and I was in a psychiatric care hospital for two months when I was 15. And to be honest, before I got into personal growth, like I wanted to end my life in 2016 because at the time I was a single mom and my, my youngest boy at the time would have been graduating. So it's like giving myself permission, right? Like not holding myself accountable for life, just, just living, right? Like just surviving. And, um, by the grace of God, I got into personal growth and I realized that life is a choice. You know, I have a choice to sit in this area of poor me, life isn't worth it, let me get out, or I have an opportunity to create the life that I wanted. And so in believing in myself, in learning that all my worth comes within, I don't have to look out for it. Learning that my, knowing that I'm enough is about me knowing I'm enough, not other people knowing I'm enough. So I started to look inward versus looking outward for validation and, you know, accreditation and everything else. And I started to realize that the reason why I have this filter of being bullied my entire life is because I always looked on the outside. I always looked for other people's voices and words to validate who I was. And when I stopped doing that, I realized that I have the reason why I survived. Like I used to ask myself, like, why am I living God? Like, why don't you just take my life? Like I'm telling you, you know, like I'm being your martyr, like just take me. And God just kept saying no. And so as I got older and I always questioned that, I realized the reason why I had to live through all of this is because I had to walk through the shoes. I had to experience. So now I could talk to other kids. I was just talking to a child yesterday who's 10 years old, who's suicidal. And the thing is, is that you know, I understand the clinical view of it. I have a degree in psychology. I'm not a psychologist, but I have a degree in it. So I've done book work, right? And I understand the mindset. I understand, you know, the the book textbook stuff of it. But I feel like I go even deeper because I lived it. Like if somebody would have asked me certain questions at that age and really got me to feel safe and open up and share the experiences of what was I was internalizing, maybe I wouldn't have been suicidal. Maybe I wouldn't have cut myself as an escape to numb the pain, right? And so now because I know that in a in a different internal deep sense i now can talk to kids and have them have that safe space to just feel like wow i could talk to this woman like she gets me right and by doing so they open up to me and i'm able to just shift pivot that mindset ask them a better question reframe what they're going through let them see the greatness versus their weaknesses and it's just been a beautiful opportunity because people that bully or tease or, you know, um, haunt, whatever we want to say to other people, they're hurting, 
hurt people hurt people. And instead of saying, oh, I'm going to take my kid out of the school because they're being bullied. Like, I get it. I have six kids. That would be my response. Let me protect my child. But in doing so, let's also have the compassion and the empathy to go back and say, what's going on with that child? Something is going on where they do not feel significant. They don't feel connection. They don't feel the love. They don't feel enough in their self because if they did, they wouldn't have to go take it from somebody else. They wouldn't have to go steal it, rob it from somebody else, right? So there's two components to that, to protect your child and again, go back and support the bully to find out what is going on either at home or in their environment, but it's, it's not internal. You know, and then the flip side of that is the mental health aspect of it, right? Um, I was a mental health professional for many years and looking at the mental, mental health, like everybody wanted like, oh, give meds, give meds, give meds. But, you know, when I was younger and they wanted to put me on an antidepressant when I was cutting, that pill didn't say, oh, I don't want to cut myself today. That pill didn't do anything because nobody was getting to my mindset of what I was internalizing. They were trying to chemically shift my brain pattern to say, oh, maybe they will do better. It didn't make me do better. I still cut. I still was depressed. I still wanted to kill myself. Wow. You know, all it did is give me the side effects of diarrhea and headaches. I mean, you know, what, what was that? You know, so I took on this crusade or empowerment or whatever you call it, you know, to help kids to realize that self-worth starts internally. Oh my it, God, Vinu, what you're sharing is you've been so vulnerable and opening your heart and everything. This is, this is very much information as well as like we felt it. Like you have gone through that path, you know exactly how they're feeling and what's going to be their next step. So you can go back and help these kids. It's, it's, it's just beautiful how you reframed it for yourself as well. You yes. took that challenge as like a life's gift and now you're giving back that gift. It's almost like you're living on purpose. That's, that's beautiful. Well, the thing is, if we think about now, like as adults, like we've all been through personal growth, right? Why, why do we have to go through personal growth? Because something's happened in our past that we had to have an opportunity to find the gift in it. So what if there was enough of us working with our youth now to reframe it at their age. Where are they going to be as adults? They're not going to have to deal with all of this because they've corrected it. They've reframed it and given themselves a new filter to go forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because how many adults I work with now, even to shift their identity, you know, mm -hmm. when I coach adults, I'm looking at, you know, where did these patterns start from? And I promise you all these patterns of, I'm not good enough. I don't know if I can do that. You know, what am I going to be if I'm not married? What am I going to be if my kids do leave me? We've learned to attach our identities to different things because that's what we've done as children. Instead of recognizing the identity that we create within ourselves and then asking the question, what can I do? Exactly. And at this stage, Orkun, actually, I, I want to talk to you a little bit more about this because I know that you're in a way not coaching, but helping also corporate world in terms of like corporate wellness. And it's not only the little kids or teenagers that's facing this. A lot of bullying is taking place at corporates too, right? Yes, actually, Elise, when I started this um, job of mine, counseling, I started working with kids first. But then I realized after some time that, you know, there's nothing to fix thing, fixing kids, you know. Fix, uh, kids don't change if you don't change the parents. So mm -hmm. um, then I stepped into this uh, family and relationship business. Uh, and after, after some time, yeah, I, I graduated in the UK um, studied psychology and philosophy. Then I um, specialized in acceptance and commitment therapy. And as, as we said, um, people want to help others because they needed help themselves sometimes. So um, sometimes you just can't change things and you, know, you can't help yourself. And then you just want to accept what's going on and then commit with what you have. You know? That's, uh, that comes to acceptance and commitment therapy's philosophy. So things that you can change and you can't, yeah? So um, then I returned to Turkey after my studies. I um, worked as a psychologist at the hospital, a foundation for uh, hospital and the foundation for children with leukemia. And things really depressed me so much. Yeah. And uh, after, after I, I saw all the, uh, so many cases also bullying, even 
you know, leukemic kids, you know, when they don't grow hair, it's so, so, so cruel. And, uh, well, I, I came this far, so far so good. And um, now I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm being a psychotherapist, working with kids, families, also with companies. And yeah, I'm based in Istanbul and also doing online sessions with people all around the world, yeah. Yes, and thank you very much for that. We all need, not only Turkey, not the men and region, but the whole world needs this now because families are stuck with the kids at home. <laughs> and um, while talking about this, I'm going to uh, give the microphone to Vinu. Uh, Vinu, can you tell us a little bit like Mm, strategies maybe how to cope with kids at home if they've been bullied online you know right now all the kids are homeschooling and uh, yes so they're not at school but now I'm hearing that a lot of cyber bullying is taking place so tell us a little bit if, if parents are hearing this what can they do if they find out what's going on because sometimes kids hide it especially cyberbullying. Uh, they don't get to see it. Maybe they go to their room, they cry, but you don't know why. So tell us a little bit about that, if you would. So there's different aspects that we need to, we need to really look at, right? Like, first of all, personalities come into play a lot, right? Like, if your child, you know, like the disc profile, for instance, if your child is a high I, they need connection. They need that interpersonal connection. They need to talk. They want to inspire people. They want to connect with people. They're extroverts, you know. So understanding your children's personality, first of all, is going to be a huge, huge thing, right? Because if you have a child that's you know a high s or a high c personality they're very passive right like the s just wants to get along with everybody so and then the d's are the ones that are probably like what i would say most bullies are high d's right they're dominant they're they're going to set the pace they're going to tell you how it's going to be they're very determined they're very direct and what happens is all these other personalities want to be a part of that right and they want to be like well i want to be like them like, look how boisterous they are. Look how, you know, they can just uh, articulate what they want and they get the results they want, right? Because they're just result driven. Mm -hmm. What they don't see is what it takes for that person to be that, right? The insecurities. Mm -hmm. And now with this coronavirus where we're all in, one of the things we have to understand about, you know, kids education, the biggest part to me of kids education is social emotional, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, social emotional is huge in educating a child. And what have we done now? We've said, okay, now we can't have that physical contact. And people say social distancing. I don't like that word because we are physically distancing. I am more social now <laughs> than I've ever been in my life. And you, like, you know me, like I'm, I'm yeah, definitely that person that needs to connect. And because of that, I create opportunity, right? I get on zoom calls. I reach out to people. I've reached out to people. I haven't reached out to in my entire life just because I want to connect and I'm learning a new, it's giving me a new opportunity on how to be vulnerable and connect with more people, right? Because I am craving that. It's not my same circle of friends, right? There's no events to go to right now. I'm not traveling right now. Yeah. And so this is my connection and the same thing with children. So when there is cyberbullying going on, what is that really? It's still that child still craving that attention, still looking for their significance, still wanting to say, Hey, do you see me? Do you see me? Mm -hmm. And so they create this like trend or uh, a post that goes viral and the other child that sees it, whether it's about them or somebody else, because some of these kids are empathetic. Like if you're a high S, you're really empathetic to people, right? Because you want everybody to get along. And so this is what happens, you know? And so what I would tell parents is number one, start to recognize what personality your child has. So you first can connect with your child. I by, think the way, the by the way, uh, since we're familiar with the terms, but just to be able for our listeners and viewers to understand as well, can you tell us about the, these types you've been mentioning, where it's coming from? Okay, so the DISC uh, personality test is a, it's called the DISC theory personality test, right? So you can Google D-I-S-C and all, every letter stands for a certain personality. All of us in the world have a personality. 
and some of them are combined, some of them are higher, some of them are lower. And so if you just go and you can Google the disc, you'll see D is like I said, dominant, determined. I is more um, inspirational, you know, um, and talking to people, connecting with people. S wants stability. They, they, they're not flexible, right? They need, they want everybody to get along. They're the peacemakers. You know, and then a C is somebody that's very task oriented. They need all the facts. They need organization. So does that help? Absolutely. And also okay. uh, on TonyRobbins.com, they can get a free disc test, right? They can. They can. Perfect. They absolutely. And they can reach out to me because um, there's also more, and I'm sure Orkin can tell you, like there's definitely things that, that support those personalities that we don't even see that are innate in us, right? Because of the way we were born, because of the environment we grew up in. Like if you have grown up in an abused environment, you know, you may have an underlying behavioral attitude index that supports why you're a S or a C more passive, right? Amazing. So there's different things. And so like there's, there's a battery of assessments that's called the 4D. Right. So, so we the look first at one is they get to do the test and know their selves. Perfect. Correct. Because let me tell you, I just read an article on this about how parents need to engage with their children. Right. You ask me a question. You say, so what do these parents do when they see their kid crying in the room and they don't know why? Well, if you know your child, if you have that rapport, rapport is being able to connect and feel open and feel that you can trust. Right. Trust is built off communication. How do you engage with your children? We as parents assume rapport. And I'm telling you, I'm guilty. I did it with my boys. I, I'm their mom. Of course they love me. Of course they're going to talk to me. Of course they're going to tell me what's wrong. No, you can't assume rapport with your children. If though you knew that, like, I'm a very high D, right? So I'm very de determined. I'm very rule oriented. Um, I'm very result oriented. But my children are not D's. But if I treated them as this is how you're going to do it, this is where we're going to go, I broke rapport. I can't engage with them because all they're thinking is mom's not going to listen to me. She just wants the results. She just wants the outcome. She doesn't have time for me, especially if they're an I, right? If there's something that needs to connect and needs that open communication and they've seen my pattern, that's mom's like, come on, come on, come on, let's get it done. And they're like, wow, why would they want to talk to me? Why would they want to come and open to me? Because they already have this hallucination that I'm not going to listen to them because I just want the results. So it's so, so important that you know how to connect with your child. Because if they're crying in the room and they're not talking to you, it's probably because they don't know how to connect with you. Mm. They don't want to. Get, and the other thing is, and Orkin, I would love to hear your, uh, the clinical part of this, but if a kid feels that you're going to judge them, they won't talk to you if they feel already judged. And the other aspect is if they think that they're going to disappoint you, they won't uh -huh. connect with you. They don't want, again, to feel not enough. And the third aspect is they don't want you to hurt, right? When I was suicidal, I didn't tell my mom because I didn't want to hurt my mom. I did not want to hurt her. And really, children do things for you, like you're for, for their parents, for their father and mother. Like, um, Children doesn't really, I mean, um, how can I say this? Like, children doesn't really, really think that they should get really good results at school. They don't really care about, you know, results. They just want their mom to be proud of, you know, or their father to be proud of, or, and they, they want their acceptance. And that's what they work for. So um, giving, them, giving them open space, like, as, as we knew said, it's so important without being, you know, judgmental about them. And connecting with the kids sounds very easy, but it's actually, it's very deep. Like, you know, um, because we judge all the time, there's this, um, there's this voice in, inside our, our heads and it's coming to, maybe that voice comes to, from our parents, from their parenting, you know, do this, don't do that. There are this, this ethics mm. called super ego in psychology yeah it's yeah. all about morality what is wrong and what's right yeah so um like when i was a when i was a child therapist um, a child walks into my uh, office my my room and uh, of course not not a lot of kids love to go to a therapist right mm -hmm. so um they just start screaming 
and you know just running around in, inside of the room yelling and uh, the mother uh, sits there in front of you you know feeling probably guilty because of you know her kid and saying that saying to me that you know that's why we came unfortunately my my child has aggressive behavior you know this is aggression and maybe, maybe trying to talk with my terminology but i say you know that's not aggression maybe that's what you call aggression but i call this freedom why because when a child is angry yeah they want everyone to hear their voice they don't care about the neighbors or you know people around them they just they are hurt and they just want to yell yeah they scream they run that's freedom that's what we we lost actually Yeah. And we are so into like what we should do and shouldn't do. Yeah. But what do we want really? So keeping that in mind, leaving the space for the kid, of course, in a controlled environment. Yeah. And let them be free. And uh, we just are too, pre um, too, uh, we want to control the kids. Yeah. And when they are bullied, bullied, for example, we are so, people get panic, you know, maybe, maybe it's even, even a hard bully, you know, you know, a sexual bully, physical, physical abusive behavior they would face. Uh, but, but because we panic, we just, uh, we lose our control and ask so many questions, so many questions, and they don't need to hear all this. So we should first actually give them space and, and say, maybe, what did you hear? Why are you asking me this questions? What do you think happens? You know, first learn their news, their stories, then tell yours after. Mm. So the communication part here, what uh, Vini was always uh, also was sharing, amazing, amazing. Um, so can I what? I one thing, can I say one thing about what he was saying? Um, so one of the things. So I have a seven-year-old boy. I have twins, and He has this, I, will, I love that term, by the way, that freedom, right? So what I feel as a parent is that we need to show up for our kids, right? Because when we get upset, when we get frustrated, what are we doing? We're also looking for that freedom, right? Because to me, anger is a second emotion. There's something underlying yeah. and we don't know how to express it, but we definitely, so if I'm hurting, it's hard for me to be vulnerable and say, I'm hurting. But it's easy for me to be like, ah, and then you know, right? Like, it, that's easy for me. And so with my child, and I'll just share this quick story if I might. So the other day, um, I was very frustrated. For me, frustration comes when there's no time, right? Like, I have a coaching client. I got to do homeschool. And then I got another coaching client. And I'm like, come on, come on, come on. Learn on my schedule. You're on my schedule. And so I get <laughs> frustrated. And I'm like, and my voice elevates, right? Because I don't feel like I'm being heard. And I don't feel like I'm being heard because they're not hearing me because I'm, I'm rushing them. I'm not speaking slowly enough for my children who have dyslexia and have ADHD to really hear what I'm saying. And so I'm not present with them. I'm just present with the results, mm. right? And so what happens is I raise my voice and then I watch my son who's seven when he is not being heard, he needs to be heard. Like he definitely is somebody that needs to be heard. And I've realized the strategy with him. So he goes like this when he's mad. <laughs> so that night I went to his room and I was doing our gratitude at night, our Ho'oponopono and our gratitude. And I said to him, I said, you know, when mommy was yelling today, I said, that felt pretty yucky. And he's like, yeah. And I said, can you do me a favor? I said, you have, to please know that I was not mad at you. I said, mommy just gets frustrated and I didn't know how to express it. And it came out that way. And he's like, yeah, you're really stressed. And I said, thank you for seeing that. Mommy was stressed. You're right. I was. And I said, can you do me a favor? When you see mommy like that, can you just grab my hand and tell me to take a breath and tell me it's going to be okay? And he's like, yeah. And that lit him up because I was giving him some control. Kids need control. Okay. Wow. So then I said, and when you go, can I grab your hand and tell you to take a breath and tell you it's going to be okay? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, let's high five on that. Can I tell you, this was a week ago. Everyone in our family has a way of expressing with elevation of voice. 
And we all do it different ways, right? Because different things frustrate us, hurt us or whatnot, because we all have different ways of interpreting things. He is the one that says, okay, take a breath. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> or like when he sees me maybe with my husband, because I'm like, okay, you got to do this. You got to do that. And I'm not even frustrated. I'm just speaking fast because I have two seconds to tell him before I get on another call. My son interprets this. He's like, okay, mom, take a breath. It's going to be okay. Or he tells his dad, dad, take a breath. It's going to be okay. Just because I took that time to connect with him on his level, like Orkin was saying, I gave him that opportunity, that space. And I was vulnerable enough to him to say, hey, look, even as an adult, I go through it. And again, I'm looking for that freedom, right? Because hurt people hurt people. And so yeah. if we can give our children that space to really connect with us and say, hey, we're all going through it. What did I do for him? I took away judgment. So he knows that when he does that, I don't judge him. I just, I realize it. You know, I understand his model of the world where he sees it through his eyes and I give him a space to welcome him into my model of my world of what I'm going through. So there's no judgment for him either that it wasn't about him. Right. Imagine Beautiful. as he's seven and he's growing up with these aspects, imagine how he will be to me. That's emotional mastery. It is. It absolutely is. And that's going to build the nations to come. This is how we're going to plant the seeds in them and they're going to, you know, uh, bring up all those kids with high intelligence and also uh, powerful communication. So you're already uh, teaching them how to lead. That's beautiful. And you know what we knew? It, just like you said, it's with your boy with seven years old. And I do the same thing with my dad. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> Exactly. I mean, the anger is anger. It's the little kid in him that's, that wants to be heard. And they don't know either. Like we are a generation in between. We're like a bridge. Uh, mm -hmm. The old generation doesn't know how to deal with anger either. They want to yell and they want to use aggression in order to be heard. So in a way, us being the kids, we can even teach our parents have yeah. to communicate that and I was just smiling when you were sharing it with your kid because that's what I did with my dad who was diagnosed with uh, dementia and Orkun knows about it as well we worked a lot of things on on that together thank you again for that and I hold his hand and I said can I love you at times of when you're feeling angry because mm -hmm. I can see he's angry mm -hmm. to himself mm -hmm. and I ask him to name five things that he loves about himself Beautiful. So that brings out the soul, that loving, compassionate soul within him out. That just like, it's like calling him out. Because we all have it, you know, I move, you know, and at least, you know, I created this program where I actually move in with families. And it's yeah. funny, Orkin, when you were yeah. saying like, we, oh, you don't know? Yeah, it's oh, called no, the, in, no. it's called the in-home turnaround. And I've been doing it for years. Like I've been all over the world, Australia, Mexico, like I moved in with families for four days. And Orchid, it was so funny because you're like, we're really not working with the kids. We're working with the parents because that's what I do. Like oh, I go wow. in and it's kind of like teaching them how to reparent with these skills, right? Because it's kind of like what, again, just piggybacking off of what Orkin was saying is that we have got to create this opportunity to not blame and shame our kids. Like I was teaching my children. I wish I had it here. But like he was saying results, like my kids don't know what an A is or a C. Like they don't know. They're in second grade. Yeah. But I feel as my duty as a mom to guide them to, to not impose my standards, but to figure out what is their standards and how could I support them in raising it, right? So I put down A, B, C, and D. I put A, best, B, good, C, okay, D is uh-oh, and F is mm. And I asked them, I said, what feels good for you? And now remind, like, they're not happy, right? They don't, my kids don't like to write or do school. Like they have dyslexia, they have a lot of challenges. And so they get frustrated really easy. And so they weren't saying anything. So I drew a line between the C and the D. And I said, this is where your older brothers were. And my boys now are 26 and 21. And I said, you know what? Even though they were between the ooh and the uh-oh, I said, I love them and your brothers are doing so good. And I said, I love them just as much. And I'm so proud of them, even though they were here. So tell me, where would you like to be? 
And the reason why I did that is because I wanted them to know that even if they're at an uh-oh stage right now, it doesn't take away my love. It doesn't take away how proud I am of them because I need them to learn their internal voice that no matter where I'm at, it's good enough right now. Wow. And they both said to me, they want to be at the best, right? Because they're kids, they're competitive. They still have that. All, first of all, we all have the DISC in us. Okay. We all have a DNS. We all have all of it in us, but sometimes some are higher than others. So that competitive in them wants that best. And I said, great. What would that feel like for you to feel that best? And I just put away the paperwork, right? I took away the writing. I took everything away because I really just wanted them to focus on what the feeling of best meant to them at seven years old. Because best to me at 46 is definitely different from best at seven, right? <laughs> and they would explain it to me and I'm like, tell me what that looks like. Tell me what that feels like. Show me what that would look like in your body, right? Like what's that in your physiology? And they were like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, your face that's best. They're like, no, this is best. I'm like, yeah, show me that. I said, okay. So if we were going to write this paper together and I was going to support you in it, what would we want to write that would be best for you? Oh my gosh. Like what a win. These are the strategies I teach parents, you know, because these kids that are 15 that are yelling at their parents, not listening to their parents, these three-year-olds that are ruling the roost because it's, they get what they want because all they have to do is throw a temper tantrum, right? Or they're still sleeping in their parents' beds or the mom feels like a chef cook because she has to make five different meals because nobody wants to eat the one meal she's making. These are kids controlling. It goes back to kids want control. And I, I call it controlled control, right? Give it in a controlled environment but and give your them control. <laughs> boundaries, right? Yeah. So if we could just move into like, you know, talking about like the abused parents, like what happens there, right? And my hallucination, I would love to hear Orkins. I feel like these parents have a sense of loss of control and that when they have these kids that are adults, they feel that if they allow their children to be independent and to go out, they're losing, they're losing a part of them. They're losing that identity, right? Because yeah, well, let's they, ask Orkun that as well. I want to hear his, it. Yeah, yeah, very true. And uh, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, I want to hear what you want to say on that too. Remember the the uh, beautiful 25 years old girl that I mentioned to you on Instagram. So if anyone wants to hear your side as well, what do you think? Like, why do you think, especially at times of fear, just like COVID, like, parents are scared to death you know so the fear comes up in them and maybe they are not they don't know how to cope with emotions and fears so they become abusive to their kids what do you think and uh, what would you what would you recommend the kids or not the kids but the teenagers maybe over 20 or 25 that they can do and also I also, the, the second part of it, I want to ask you what Vinu has shared with the families and the kids. Sounds like they could also be used at the corporate world. So I want to hear that from you as well. Um, well, uh, actually, you know, Vinu um, said so many, so many good things uh, about, you know, kids and kids, kids and parents. We want kids to be loved and you know, feel that they are lovable, you know, felt, felt, felt the love, basically. And also we want to be authoritarian. Actually, trust comes from boundaries. So if you think that, you know, you can do anything and you don't get punished, then you get scared, you know, you don't know what is, what is no. And then when you get into the corporate world, as, as you said, then um, it's like, you know, you don't, you, you misbehave or you don't know how to behave because you can do anything. You're a princess at home. You're a king at home, you know? Everybody loves you. And uh, then attachment problems comes along. Like at the age of 12 even, not uh, far to uh, the corporate world, but at the age of 12, you know? Uh, kids go to schools and then some kids, uh, some kids don't play with them. And then they come home and uh, say, hey, those two people, they don't play with me. They don't love me. You know, mm. what, what is that? What is that? How, how does it relate to, you know, because they think that they are always loved and they always, uh, everybody loves them and do what they say. So how come, you know, they don't play with, with the, with the kid. Trust comes from boundaries and uh, knowing 
knowing um, knowing what what is what is known to be honest and uh, kids if you if you want them to them to grow grow up um, responsible you know enough um, you should you should be a model to them they do what they what what you do as a parent but they don't do what you say basically um, so monkey then, sees and monkey does yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, monkey see monkey do <laughs> oh there you go there you go yes <laughs> and they pick up your emotions like you know kids at the age of two they have this cortex you know grown up so they can um, they um, start analyzing and understanding what's around them yeah they can think uh, and their conscious behavior starts now at the age of two but till the age of 12 they actually don't have abstract concepts like an adult do so they just suck up, suck up your emotions but they don't understand what is loneliness what is death you know abstract concepts so um you should be you should calm yourself first if you want your kid to be calm it's like on the flights you know put up your own mask first then to your kid so um sucking up emotions things like i was a kid in front of me and um his mother yelled yelled at him okay said said something said 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 a boundary or a rule to to him but then started yelling saying that you know you can't do this I didn't I'll tell you, you know, and kids started crying. I calmed the kid and said, you know, asked, asked him, what's your mom saying to you? And the kid said, she's yelling at me. Yes, she's yelling at you, true. But what did she say? What was her message? And then I realized actually the kid can't perceive the message. They just perceive the parents' emotions. Yeah, because they are just sucking up your emotions. So um, you can't use your emotions towards them and you can't expect more if you can't be calm yourself. Like, like you know, parents say, do your homework, you make me sad. That's actually dictating your emotions towards your kid, you know, using your emotions. Emotions are so powerful. So you don't have to involve your emotions when you are connecting with your kid. Okay, give them space. But, you know, what it does is a kid, when they grow up, they say, you know, what is, what do I have to do? I mean, working, I mean, doing my homework makes you happy. I'm not doing that, that for you. You know, I'm doing that for myself. So trust comes actually from your responsibilities and your boundaries and knowing what you can do. It's that feeling that you can do. You know, how can I explain this? Like at the age of two, you carry your toys and boxes to the living room and say, can I carry this? Can I hold the baby? You know, and the parents say, no, you can't. Then you, it affects their trust. I mean, because they just want to be, want, want to do it. And that feeling of doing it, I can do it, is trust. Mm. Or blaming it at the end. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Vini, what, what are you going to say about these things? They're amazing stuff, huh? Yeah, it's, it's so true. Like, you know, I feel like, it, and that's what it is. As parents, we need to come in and teach our parents. Like, we have to have, I don't like calling parenting styles, right? Conscious parenting is. Parenting is a behavior, right? It, plain and simple, it's a behavior. So we don't need to call it anything. But what we can do is watch our behavior. Are we blaming and shaming our children? Like Orkin said, when that mom came in and that child was having this freedom moment, the mom felt so ashamed because what we do is we think the way our, parents, our kids behave, it reflects on us. And what happens? If it reflects on us, we have another emotion because that emotion wants to protect. So we have to understand all of our emotions are, that we have are here to serve us. Every emotion, whether it's unresourceful or resourceful, is here for a reason to protect. So shame is a reason to protect. What's the gift in that, right? So if we as parents started to realize that how our children's act has no reflection that if I'm a good parent or not, it would change the whole trajectory of how we parent we would feel less guilt and guilt would say, 
we would put boundaries. Like he said, like if we don't put boundaries, there is no safety. Why do we not put boundaries? We want our kids to like us. We want to be friends with our kids. God did not give us a child, number one, as a object. We don't own them. They're not ours to keep. They are a gift. A child is a gift that God said, hey, I pick you to teach this child, to guide them, to give them whatever you can, love, nurture, or not, right? Because there's kids that don't have that, abuse kids, but that's their lesson in this life. Yes, this is and, their gift. And it's not, you know, I've had my boys have had run-ins with the law and, you know, um, I'm working on, you know, trying to get a TV show with my in-home turnaround. And, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, people are going to pull up my children. And that was a, a brief moment. And I'm like, so what? Yay, let them. Because what my children have done as adults or even kids is not a reflection on who I am and what I have become and what I continue to become, right? Because it's constantly growing and learning and becoming more for my children and for myself. Yes. So teaching parents to parent without the blame and the shame to not say like, you know, why did you do that? You know, but ask your kids, what did it mean to you? Like the questions that Orkin said, like we have got to get more curious and stop telling kids what they have to be and ask kids what they want to be. Yes. And also like everything that you guys said has everything to do with looking at um, the family and the kids and the communication, a holistic perspective. There is a higher reason why things happening the way that they do. And when you can look from a, a bird's eye view, what's happening in the family, then you detach yourself from the issue that's happening. So you're looking from a higher perspective and then you become more calm, more compassionate, more loving, which leads them to solutions. Otherwise, when you're frustrated, you're just closing yourself and you cannot even find answers that needs to be found at that communication state. And what Vinu and also Orkun was sharing with us was so much powerful, especially around powerful questions, like asking, first of all, within you, like powerful questions, including like, okay, this kid is right now bothering me. I acknowledge that. I know that, I see that, but there is a reason. She or he is there to grow me as a mom or to grow me as a dad. It's the same thing with colleagues, right? Whenever someone is calling up on you or bothering you, that means there is still uh, um, a state of being that you can grow into being more understanding, more patient, more loving, more compassionate. So when you become like settled within you, like, okay, this is something in my control. Let's see how I can influence it right now. And then asking the kid the powerful questions that Vinu mentioned is going to also teach them to ask powerful questions in the future, not only in the family, but also in the corporate world too. Well, Guys, I think we've also, we've also like learned through, you know, our generation to be self beaters. Like we beat ourselves up. Everything we do, we, we judge ourselves. What if we stopped being self beaters and started being self builders, right? Instead of saying, oh, why did I do that? I screwed up and shame on me instead of saying, wow, like that was an opportunity. What did I learn from that? Wow. Oh my gosh. I will not do that again. One of the things I teach my children and my husband and myself, everybody around me is don't tell me sorry and then go back and do it again tomorrow. That's not sorry. Sorry means that I acknowledge, kind of like what you just said. I acknowledge I've done this. I've acknowledged this emotion. I acknowledge I responded in a way. How do I want to repair it now? How do I want to be different tomorrow or the next opportunity that comes, right? Because if you're going to keep doing the same thing, don't be sorry. Yeah. You know, yeah. be aware. i rather you say, okay, I'm aware versus, okay, I'm sorry. Because the more you become aware you know, like when my twins fight, I have a boy, girl, twin, right? So there's a lot of different energies going on, you know? <laughs> um, so they fight. And it's funny because my twin daughter overpowers my son. And like, she like put it like, oh, he pushed me on the ground. Oh, she pushed me on the ground and she put my hand in the rabbit poop. And, da -da -da -da. and I'm like, why didn't you get up and, you know, fight back? And he's like, 
well, you know, we're not supposed to hit a girl. I said, true, true. But when your sister is dragging you around in the rabbit cage, you know, wrestling with you, he's like, can I be honest? I said, absolutely. He's like, I was afraid. I was afraid I was going to get beat up by a girl. And I didn't want to tell my friends I got beat up by my sister. You know, I mean, wow. That's vulnerable talk. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, but this is what's going on. So Sage, my daughter, her name is Sage. She says, well, I'm sorry. I said, are you? Because you continue to like, you know, take him down on the ground and, you know, in the living room everywhere. I said, I want you to be aware. And why? Because every time, she, instead of saying, I'm sorry, she goes, okay, I'm aware. I'm aware. I'm aware. What is she doing to that conscious mind now? Mm. She's becoming aware. New way of act. wiring also. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because don't be sorry. Don't be sorry and then go take him down again. Just say, I'm aware. I'm aware. I'm aware. And then one day she will be sorry because now she will have shifted that behavior and she won't have to do that anymore because she's aware. Awareness Beautiful. first. Would Beautiful. you agree, Orkin? Like awareness first? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. If you, Beautiful. If you know what you're doing, then you can change it. Otherwise, if you're, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, there's nothing to change. Absolutely. Right. Guys, thank you so much. Before we conclude, anything that you would like to tell our watchers and viewers around the topics that we talked about or anything that you would like to invite because there's so much other things that can be learned from both of you. And right now, a lot of people are looking for answers because they don't know and they're stuck in their homes and now we're getting into the new norm, like building the new norm. Even there, they're going to be coming back to internet to look for answers. Anything that you would like to invite them to? Um, yeah. So any of your viewers here, um, I, would, I will offer a free uh, coaching call, a discovery call. They can, um, I know you're going to put my links up there and it'll be in there, the 30 minute call that they can just click on and schedule time with me. And I could at least help them uh, create some strategies to go forward you know, um, hear what they have to say, look at where they're at and where they want to go and see, help them see what they need to do differently to get the quality of life they want and deserve. Wow. That's such a contribution. Thank you very much, Vinu. Um, Yeliz, we started the talk with, you know, understanding the parts of, uh, parts of, you know, bullying behavior um, and being aware, you know, ended with the being aware part. We also should really be aware of uh, what's what's uh, coming from our mouth, our tongues. Yeah, words are so powerful. And uh, also, when we are talking about bullying, you know, there is an old saying: "Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me." Well, uh, sticks and stones will break our bones, and words too can damage and hurt. Yeah. So, um, and maybe maybe they can do far more harm than sticks and stones ever could. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can control out our tongues simply by what we allow in our hearts. Mm. So um, we, give, we give people space, first understand what's going on inside of us and what do we tell ourselves, our words, even to our kids, and then maybe change after, after, after you know, understanding what's going on inside. So, yeah. Be mindful Beautiful. about what you do. Absolutely. And I love it. Also, Vinny, I would love to invite you to a group of people that we got together in Istanbul. It's called Love Mafia. Uh, I'm sure you're going to love the name. <laughs> and uh, whenever you're going to be visiting Turkey after all this craziness, you know. I know. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to welcome you there and host you so that you can inspire more families and kids and not only that like all these things that shared with Orkin and I were constantly doing some workshops there we would love to see you I would well. love to maybe a family wants to hire me to come move in with them <laughs> <laughs> you're so fed up with the six, six, six kids <laughs> you're amazing thank you guys for thank your you. heart thank you for all the contribution that you guys are doing I look so much forward to seeing you in person so when we can give some hugs as well yeah, so take care bye bye, bye. Okay. yay oh he's gone <laughs> it's still recording no is it uh, it uh, says recording I, still that's fine that's fine okay. just